is essentially a surface of rotation around a singular gradient that is based off of the natural exponential, right? So this is a version of e to the negative y. Essentially, this means that the value falls off from a the expected value, the mean of the distribution, in a way that is characterized relative to the inverse of a logarithm. So at natural exponential, is the inverse of a logarithmic process. It falls off from that expected value symmetrically in both directions. At a point out here, some value relative to the integration of the space on the left-hand side of it lies a value called sigma, standard deviation. This is where two-thirds of the population will fall relative to the symmetry of this system. So if I draw the other side of it, right, in this perspective, the values here will surmise to two-thirds of the distribution, leaving one-third on the outside. What this is structurally signifying is the relationship of the bulk of the values that we're interested in relative to the central value, the expected value of the system. Now, I have a couple of visuals on the slide set. Let me grab them real quick, because now they're over here for some reason. I don't get it. <laughs> All right. Um, Show on hold. Duplicate slash show. All right, so I want to start off actually right here. Things kind of weird now. We're talking about something about it. Because we've already seen other things from some of the examples of visualizations I've done, this is the try to drive it home moment where I've talked about this, but I want, to, I want you to see the visualization of the concept that I've been talking about. Relative to the regression that's occurring, these two graphs are essentially the same thing. Now, they're not exactly the same data because I have a sourcing from two separate places to get, this, to get these pictures, but the first one is a regression relative to the points as displayed by the dots up there in the, in the left-hand panel. Notice we have the line. We also have a series of distributions, right? So relative to each value of this uh, feature, this uh, this characteristic that is given here as speed, right? So we say this is a feature or a predictor. There is a distribution that is proportional to the range of values associated with that input. The regression is set to traverse the normal of those distributions. So as we put them together, we're thinking about utilizing the characteristics of the distribution to create the likelihood estimate at each individual point. I'm not really actually placing a value on the singular points or even the summation of the point values in this case, right? So I'm looking at it in a, in a slightly different sense than what we have been looking at it before. When we think about it in terms of minimization of standard error, we're usually thinking about it in terms of this system. <coughs> so I attempt to apply a gradient descent process, right? Over here might be the process by which we attempt to minimize the standard error in the system. We notice here that we're doing so initially starting off with some value consideration, and then as we move value consideration, our slope and intercept formula are being output at the bottom, right, showing the actual values of the slope intercept formula as would be the current values of the line within the regression. We also notice over on the right hand side a value of the adjustment of simply the intercept to the output, right? So one is one here is kind of indicating strong relationship of attempting to regress given the slope. The other one on the right hand side is maintaining the same slope and adjusting the intercept and the relative output value from the system. 
Now notice something here. I want to show this with respect to another uh, value that I have. And that is the idea of association based upon error typing. Control. Why is that there? Okay. So um, we, if we have a series of points, right? These points can make up a distribution with quasi-linear relationships, with each individual point affecting the overall implied slope characteristics of the output. How is this done? Well, we can do it based upon summation of absolute error, which we've done previously. This, this we did by local regression, or we can do it, as I said beforehand, utilizing the squared error. We think about squared error as essentially a square, which makes up the error space, we have a vector, and then we're utilizing the area, the summation of area associated with the error as a result of the placement of the regression line alongside the placement of that specific point. This minimization is slightly different because when we're thinking about reducing or minimizing the total square error of the system, we're doing it for the largest number of samples that we can associate within the space. Now, as I said, this is iterative. You're not going to be able to do this in a like strict sense where you have the singular solution for all data types. What's one of the biggest problems with this? We said previously, whenever I go to compute this, what, what's my biggest problem? Past a certain point, this gets very computationally intense, right? Let's say that I just go, we pop back to our uh, other slides here, our PowerPoint. We go back to this guy. How do I, how do I develop this? You guys remember how we developed these? These distributions? All right, so we talked about these as, if I were to, if I were to describe it to you in this way, we have, you, you're not quite there yet, because you might not have had it in the other classes. 394 is a place where we typically establish kind of those ideas. But utilizing a series of discrete values, right? These are the actual samples of the data that I took in, right? So discretized characteristics of the data points are sampled within the space. And the hope is that by understanding the composite of these, I will be able to make an assessment, right? So I have actual literal values, each one of these being, you know, a little, let's say this is two dimensional, so this is a little tuple of x, y values, right? And I'm going to, from this system, derive some relationship, a functional relationship, that is outputting the value of the probability for x. So the function that's provided there is a probability function based upon a density estimate. This says how likely is a certain value. So let's say this is, a, this is the new value that we're interested in here, right? How likely is this certain value to occur relative to the central value of the system? Now what I mean by how likely is it to occur is with respect to the values that we've previously seen, I would like to predict the likelihood of that value falling close to the expected value, close to the average. So I say, you're an average student. What does that mean? So, you guys have seen this before. I know you have. This is C, this is A, this is F. Okay? Why is C the average? Because of the fact that relative to this system, there are fewer A's, there are some B's, there are some C's, some D's, some F's, right? The population that comprises these regions, a range of values, is comprised of breaking up that standard performance curvature. We see that the population of, from perfect students, right, perfect, I say this is just mastery of the concept, whether you can bring it across, down to doing okay, 
should be mirrored across or relatively mirrored across the system. So when we talk about curving the grade, the curve I'm talking about, the curvature that is being input, input there, is this Gaussian normal curvature. This is the underlying relationship that says, based upon previous students that I've experienced, what category do you fall in? Are you exceptional, right? So let's say the value falls right here. Is that exceptional? No, why? Because of the fact that relative to the volume of the area that, is, that it shares its coexistence with, it's pretty average, right? It's, it's mostly the population, right? We'll say here, this is pop, right? Over area, or excuse me, am I doing this right? Area over pop, right? Area relative to population. So I say, if there's a new student, how likely are they to get a C in the class with this distribution? Uh, hi. It's, it's the area, right? It is representative of the area that they correspond to. So the further you get away from the expected value, so we'll say expected is a C, right? So the further you get away from the C, the more points you put into it, then the more likely your performance is going to exceed. The less you put into it relative to your to the average or standard performance, right? If you only study one hour right before the test, then you're likely going to fall off of that yeah. spectrum on the other end. So whenever I encounter a new individual, a new sample population individual relative to some paradigm, let's say, let's say that this is across all the classes at the school. Okay? These are individual distributions relative to a singular class. And we're gonna look at the likelihood of over the course potential, over the course period, right? We had 101 classes all the way up to 400 level classes. And we would like to understand what the distribution, the trajectory distribution is relative to those students. Most of them are gonna fall on the central axis, but some of them are going to fall on the upper limits. When we think about that, how do we create that curvature? How do we regress those points? When I say that I'm interested in the mean or the average performance, that's how I assess the university at a global level, right? How well the school is doing in accomplishing its mission. Each individual class could look here at how well it's doing or how, what the numbers are relative to its mean distribution. But I would say that if globally, students tend to keep performing better and better the, the further they get in the program, right, where the mean tends to push upwards, then I would say, hey, we're actually doing well because we're preparing the students as they go through the program. So we can utilize these metrics of approximation to imply performance characteristics based upon how well we're doing. Now these values can shift around. These are very much the fixed normals. And like I said, we make that assumption. But let's say that we are interested in creating a distribution that looks a bit like that, right? The expected value of the distribution is up here because of the fact that relative to this system, we have the standard deviation is not symmetrical. So we have asymmetric distributions we have slightly different things we have to concern ourselves with in that particular case. What's happening here says, I've got a bunch of points that are relatively high density with one another on this side, but the remainder of the points are, are spread out over this side, right? It's, high, it's slightly higher density here, but it gets less and less dense on this side. All the points here are very dense and then quickly fall off on this side. So whenever we're thinking about density, that is how many values or how many individuals we're seeing relative to the value that we're assessing. So if I see relative to the mean or the center of that distribution, the average value assessed, it's a bit like a weight pulling something off center. It's a bit like a seesaw, right? So you can think of the expected value of the system as being the seesaw and all the little individuals that are on the side of it, 
pushing it down. They have a relative weight. And their weight relative to where the pivot point of that system is will give us the expected value of the system. If I put a little pivot point along the whole of the line, and then I weigh all of the individuals on either side of each of these lines relative to the system, I will have optimized the balance point. You can think of this as a surface with people on top of it, and the line as being a little, little rod, right? We put the rod underneath of the surface. What happens? If it's in the right position, it'll balance the surface. If it doesn't, it'll fall off to one side. We think about the, the slope as it offsets relative to the centralized value of that system as being these calculations. The error relative to the density of population within that distribution. So why is this sigma? We said sigma previously is the region, which is the population densities, two thirds of the population density, right? So why, that's a vast mess over generalization, by the way. I don't wanna, I don't wanna get into the, the fine compute for sigma, but take into consideration that this is the highest of highest density population characteristics, right? The region of highest density. And I say that sigma, I square it. That is the region over which, or the area over which the values are spread. How far apart, or how far out, the values of that particular distribution are spread over one another. So if I take the area, the square of that area, now I've turned a linear relationship into an area relationship. Since I have a surface that I'm attempting to maximize this relationship on, I can attempt to minimize something else to maximize the likelihood coefficient, right? I want to maximally spread these evenly over both sides of the system. So how do I do that? If I have a magnitude, I divide it in half. That places half over there and half over here. If I'm doing it relative to a distributional likelihood, I have to place half on one side, right? So I still have to place half of them over here in order to be able to have half over here. So even if the, so even if the distribution isn't totally symmetrical, the relationship will still center on placing half values on one side and half values on the other. When I do that, I have done what? I have minimized the error that is a result of the underlying distributional characteristics. However, I still have not minimized all error because there are still variance characteristics at play. This is telling me that there are variance characteristics. Sigma square has variance characteristics. This is all variance. Remember what happened with variance? We can decompose it. We said there are components of it that are relative to the bias and components of it that are relative to the offset of the system, right? The systematic variance. Now, why do we call that a biasing term if that's the bias? It's biased because of the fact that we're saying that it's weighted, a weighted offset, okay? So when I say minimization based upon my accuracy, that's where I get into the set dependence. If I have too much emphasis on accuracy, then it becomes set dependent. If I have a balance between attempting to maximize the regression coefficient and the relative offset of the system, then I can minimize this relationship. Now, we're, we'll talk about this briefly, but we'll come back to it. But what this states is standard errors are used to compute something called a confidence interval. Anybody ever seen this before? You probably have, you might not be aware of it. Confidence intervals are used with respect to polling data, right? So a plus or minus value within a polling system is what's called a margin of error. What are margins of error based upon? They're based upon my confidence interval, how confident I am. This says that I have a 95% confidence that a value or the range of values defined will have appearances within a 95% probability of the range that's constrained by the parameter. 
right? Let me read their version of it. A 95% confidence interval is defined as the range of values such that with 95% probability, right, probability, the range will contain the true unknown value of the perimeter. What do I mean by true unknown? Well, it's true, it's the correct value. Why is it unknown? What values are known and what values are unknown? What values, what targets do we know? Um, we have two sets, right? So which set do we know the values for the targets? Training. 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 So whenever I say unknown values, what am I talking about? I'm talking about it's testing. It's the testing. What about what do I mean by true unknown value? The That's prediction. The actual value of the testing data, right? So some test X will have some test Y, a label, but we don't know it. So this says that the value range will have a 95% confidence if 95% of the values for the testing will fall within that assess range. Now, what do I mean by assess range? I'm talking about assess range relative to this sigma square variance, okay? The reason why sigma square, why I say it's worse with respect to sigma square is because it's included in both of the assumption for standard error. So standard error will contain with it the distributional characteristics. So this says that I am confident 95% of the time the value that I'm interested in will fall within that two-thirds majority of the expected value of the, of the line. So I will fall within one standard deviation to one side or the other of my regression line 95% of the time. So if I have 100 points at some point, at some region that I'm testing, 95 out of 100 of those will fall one standard deviation on the one side of the line or the other. This often looks like this, right? So we have our regression line. Then we have, let's, let me just draw one system, one SD, right? There's one, one sigma, one standard deviation on either side, plus or minus. And I can look at this as sort of an alley on either side of the road that I'm looking on. Populationally, if the values fall here, Right? If this is only 5% of the values are outside, 95% inside. That is what I'm talking about when I talk about a confidence interval. I have done a good job, I have a very confident system when 95% of the values are falling on the road, on the lanes that are on either side of the center strike that I placed down this road. So I can assess this computationally by saying plus or minus two times the standard error of the system. So this is what's plus, plus is above the line and minus is below the line. So the area is established as plus or minus two times the standard error. If standard error is based upon sigma, then the width of this system is based upon the two times of the square of sigma. So it is a band relative to the distributional characteristics of the input sample data. So density, how close these points are together, how steep that, that curve is, right? We have a variety of different ways we can draw this bell curve. We talked about this one over here is not, this one is not Gaussian. This is non-Gaussian. Not Gaussian, okay? But I have a variety of different ways that I can develop a curvature, okay? This one has a specific steepness, but this one is also Gaussian, right? But has a much higher steepness. This indicates what? The points are much more likely to fall toward the center of that expected value, right? It's incredibly high density right here in the middle and then falls off quickly off to the sides.
the points are very very tight in the center and then spread out on the edges. And the other one, we can look at it in the same way. What, what do we ultimately indicate? Relatively smooth transition between the distributions. The steepness of that curvature is the steepness of the surface, of the likelihood surface, the, the gradient, if you will, of our assessment for the values of the density for the space that we provide. Okay, we spent enough time on that one. So we said one plus or one minus in either direction relative to two times that standard error will provide us with the approximation of the confidence interval. So this one, like I said, this is just kind of a, know it, it's a thing. This is the same thing as what's on the bottom there, just expand it out. Um, and for the advertising data that we were looking at previously, the confidence interval is calculated here as plus for SE is 0 0.042 and minus for SE is 0 0.053. What do I mean by that? I'm saying once I put that regression line in, in place for the advertising data, I can calculate what the likelihood of a specific cost point, how much I spent on the advertisement relative to what its income is for a over and under, right? How much should I spend above or how much should I spend below the average of the system? I can predict what the return on investment would be with a 95% confidence interval for about these values in each direction. The smaller those are, right? The smaller that confidence interval space is, the more tightly I'm going to be able to generate a quality regression. Okay, we'll talk about this, that in a little bit. So let's talk about this with respect to the concept of hypothesis testing. Everybody familiar with this? Remember this from basic sciences? Okay, good, I'm glad we have some people that are nodding back there. The H0 hypothesis implies what? Now this one puts zero at the bottom, but what else have we seen this as? Some of you might have seen this before, right? This is H null. Right, we've seen this as the null hypothesis as well, right? So H naught or H null, we call this first hypothesis the null hypothesis. This says, I can put this line wherever, right? I can, I, can, I can put it here, I can put it here, I can put it here, and it won't make any difference because there is no relationship between the points. Why would this be a, a, a hypothesis, right? This is related to the idea that we talked about, which says correlation implying causation, right? We say with the null hypothesis, it tries to keep us grounded. It's a bit like Occam's razor. It says that if I want to try to understand whether or not one thing is the causal, and it's causative and uh, antecedent, right? The, the relationship between those two is causal in a, relation, in, in a circumstance where event A occurs and then event B occurs, right? We do not observe event B as happening without event A, thus we would imply that event B is caused by event A. So if we don't see B happening without A happening, and we don't see A happening without B happening, then we would say that they are mutual, right? They're fully mutualized. But we can also say that one is dependent on the other, so dependency characteristic. So let's think about this. We say the elements are independent of one another if the null hypothesis is true. How many things are truly independent of one another in the universe in general, right? Nothing, nothing is 100% independent. They all occupy the same space. So truthfully, everything is kind of interconnected in the effect that the environment, if you expand it out enough, the environment will eventually, you know, it's the butterfly effect to carry it up to that level. Butter, butterfly flaps and swings over here and causes a tsunami on the other side of the world, right? By amplification. Now what we realize is that we can't actually analyze everything with respect to that scope. So we set our sample space up. We set up our area of influence, the relationship between the characteristics. Once I do that, now I'm gonna to attempt to create a dynamic, which is the agreement or the relationship between the elements that make it up. If I apply some 
consequence relationship between the system and it doesn't seem to bear out, meaning that whenever I put it in through regression, I can adjust the, I can adjust the value of the coefficients of the regression and I see no change in performance, I can assume that that H0 hypothesis is true. Alternative hypothesis in, in, implies the relationship that H alternative, or we could say H1, this is our first candidate hypothesis, will imply some relationship between X and Y. Now the strength of that relationship is irrelevant. Don't, con don't concern yourself with the strength of the relationship. If I was to re rate the relationship between these two, we have nothing and we have something. What is the difference between nothing and something? Infinite, okay? Because I can place this as saying the, the distance between zero and one on the number one. Zero effect is absolutely nothing, and then some effect is something quantifiable. What's, when I look at it and say, if there is any strength of relationship, I'm going to preference toward the one that is stronger. And I will eliminate the hypothesis, however it is, simply by cutting off between the two, right? I will say any increase in value is work, workable. So H0 null hypothesis corresponds to this relationship that says I can adjust the slope coefficient beta one and the output as a result of the adjustment of that value. So I can say any delta of beta one will have a roughly the same effect. So I increase beta one, I increase the slope by 10, and I take the performance of that value, and then I decrease the slope by 10, and I take the performance of that value, and the relative performance between those two is unchanged, or at least not strongly correlated to the change in the coefficient. However, if I see a change in performance as a result of the adjustment of the beta one coefficient, then I will make the implication that it is a non-zero relationship, right? There must be a correlation. So this is actually the introduction of something that we call correlation. So if I say correlation does imply causation, it is relational to statistics, okay? Many people don't understand that that is actually the basis of statistics, right? And then people go, correlation does not imply causation. It's like, in statistics it does, <laughs> right? That's the whole thing we do. We say a thing occurred and then another thing occurred, and then we attempt to put together a theory that says why those things are related to one another. It is anecdotal correlation does not imply causation. That is actually the key. Ice cream and drownings. You guys ever seen this one? Or ice cream and shark attacks, right? There is a strong correlative characteristic anecdotally between the frequency of shark attacks and the rate of consumption of ice cream. As the rate of consumption of ice cream increases, the frequency of shark attacks increases. Are shark attacks caused by the sales of ice cream? No, it's because it's warmer outside, more people are swimming, okay? Simply things happening together does not necessarily characterize that they're causal. But statistics will still utilize metrics to attempt to imply causality. Now what the hope would be is if we conducted the sample a long enough period of time, we would find that there is a frequency characteristic to the sale of ice cream and a frequency characteristic to the to shark attacks, and we would find that they're decorrelated from one another. But we have to do so for enough data points in order to be able to truly understand the split between those two systems. So we typically reduce this model down to the co-association of our standard linear model system, where we have y is equal to beta naught plus some reducible error for the null hypothesis characteristic. Notice, there is no slope here. If there's no slope, then bias is the only affecting factor. Remember previously we said if there was no slope, what was that kind of system? We said that that was a strictly biased system. We also said that it was uncorrelated, or at least we couldn't find a linear relationship between the elements, and the only thing that we could characterize it off of is the mean of the distribution. 
If the only thing that you can characterize off of is the mean of the distribution, there aren't any other identifiable characteristics. This is essentially like an equally distributed circle, right? How do you regress a circle? Talk about the distribution related to this, this uh, standard error distribution, right? The Gaussian distribution. Take it in your mind, pull it out, flip it up on its edge, and then twirl it around. Remember surfaces by creation of volume, right? You do like how you take a, you can take a uh, triangle and you can rotate it around the central and you get a, get a cone. Take this shape and distribute it, revolve it, and create a volume of surface. Now think about what the points look like of that surface volume, right? High density toward the center, but falling off symmetrically around the outside. If it is a perfectly Gaussian distribution, right, a circle of points with one central value, and you attempt to put a regression line through it, what's going to happen? Any regression line will work, right? They're all going to be the same. The correlation would be zero. It would be a null hypothesis. The relationship in that axis will be non-existent because there is no singular direction upon which we can establish a forward relationship. This is that would mean that the relationship is strictly non-linear. We might be able to create another representation of that surface, and we'll learn some of the techniques and tools that are at play. But we will continue to use this process. We first assume, anytime we see any kind of data, that there is no relationship. That's a safe assumption. Okay? Somebody comes and brings you some data, and they go, "Hey, tell me how these things are related." Start off with a null hypothesis. Start off saying, I, I don't think they are related. They maybe are coincidence, right? Co-incident, meaning they happen together, but they're not correlated other than just their temporal characteristics. They happen at the same time, but they weren't causal. Then we start off by putting together a few models that create some causal inference. I say that as I change the value of x, that the relative value of y will change in proportion. Then I can try a bunch of different ways to model that data, and I can compare them one to another. I can create HA through HZ, and then HA1 through HZ1, and then so on. Each one of these is essentially a model that I can characterize and say, out of those, I can sort the one that has the best performance. The one that has the best performance is the one that deviates this from the null hypothesis. Everybody get what I'm talking about there? Okay. We have something called a t-statistic. You guys remember the t-test? This is a stats thing, kind of. They, they stumble over it is the best way I can describe it. We don't go into it in specifically high correlative characteristics, but we compute a t-statistic, and that gives us the, the strength of the relationship characterized relative to the null hypothesis. Right? If I say beta 1 minus the null state over the standard, standard error of that coefficient, that would be related to the t-test. Now, if you guys have seen this, most likely related to something called a p-value. You guys know what p-values are? Remember p-values? What does it imply? What does the p-value imply? Point. What? Uh, it's a point uh, where the value is actually there. Mm. You're thinking about something else. You're thinking about P as actual dimensionality characteristic. No. P value is a, st is a statistical metric. Okay, So the T score is a relationship between my model and my null hypothesis model. You guys have seen everything that comes out about all these superfoods. Okay? This is the best one I can do for you. Superfood. Eat this acai berry. I eat this acai berry every day for a week. And this is what it did to my body, right? Listen, uh, every ad is that way. You scroll through the website and it's like, I said one the other day, it was like, I did 60 star crunches a day and this is what it did to my ass. And it's like, what? In, in, a, in, you know, in a week? No, it's not quantifiable in a week, okay? So I, I have a group of people. Let's say I take this half of the class and I have you guys start eating a certain amount of acai berries. I take you guys and you start eating another certain amount, or like eating acai berries, okay? Right? So I give you, I can either do, I can either give you like an acai berry substitute, 
that's not really a sideberries, but it looks and tastes like them, right? That's a blinded study. Or I just say, you guys don't eat anything that's sideberry oriented, right? Just don't eat it. Stay away from it. Then I measure some metric. Let's talk about like weight loss or cardiovascular fitness, right? And I'm gonna measure all of you guys' cardiovascular fitness, initially and then at a final time. I have one group who's eaten the berries and another group who haven't. This is where I come up with the P statistic. My initial hypothesis is no, there is no nutritional benefit to this either, right? So if I said that that was true, what would happen to the changes in baselines statistically? Pull this out in your head. What is, you've seen this experimental setup before. What happens to the change in baseline for the whole group? Is there a noticeable difference between the people that ate the Siberia and the people that didn't if the null hypothesis is true? No, there isn't. So if I took the two deviations, I took the two distributions, and I compared them to one another, I took the separation between the two, what happens? The delta is zero. That says, even though I can attempt to put a model together, there isn't one because of the fact that it's not reasonable. The p-value is a metric of the delta of the absolute value of t. This says statistical significance. You guys have heard that term before? What is a, what is a significant statistic? What does that mean? That when you ate a side berries, you guys' his health improved. You guys' his health stayed the same because you didn't eat them. So if you did something and it had an outcome, then we assume that there was a relationship between what you did and what happened. We track that back to something called a p-value, and that is a relationship between the means of the distribution. So if the mean of this distribution shifted towards healthier, and the mean of this distribution stayed the same, then delta T versus delta T naught is going to imply that there's an improvement in performance bi biomedically, biometrically, to the consumption of that product. We say that that value, p-value, has correlative 0 0.05. You've seen it before, right? Seriously, I've never had a class that has never seen that before. But go ahead, yeah. So if um, the berries they have eaten, like uh, mm -hmm. uh, they get health, uh, they get. Yeah, you weren't very good. You were in the no berry group. <laughs> okay. So I'm in the no berry <laughs> group. Check. If, Just checking to see which group he's in. Okay. <laughs> if I'm in no no berry group, so uh -huh. so they have in, their health is increased. Correct. But my health didn't, didn't increase. It's Your health didn't change. It's, changed. it's right? the same. But if I uh, see in their perspective, mm -hmm. that means we also didn't improve. From their perspective, from this perspective. Okay. No, individuals don't matter. Okay. Why do individuals not matter? Because one individual could be allergic to the acidity. The other person could not be able to process it. Okay. Maybe there's a specific chemical in it that they that we don't know what it is yet. There's a lot of times that's the case where we, where groups of people eat certain things and it seems to vastly improve their health, but we can't see it elsewhere. So what I'm looking for right now is just whether or not the whole of the group, right, did the population, the average, did the average health improve here, right? Well, if the average improved, that means everybody shifted over. We're thinking about this in terms of grades, and we had like SI study sessions, and some of you went to the SI study session and some of you didn't, and I blocked it up and I saw two distributions. I would note that the SI distribution, SI attendance distribution may have actually performed better on the tests which means you took your curve, your curve shifted up. Yeah. Meaning where your grades were relative to the system shifted. If the mean of this group stays the same, right, that adjusts for normal metabolic process. If this group's mean stayed the same, that would mean that it would be the same as the normal metabolic process group, or the normal grades of the outcome of the group. The idea is that if these systems shift in any way, if the means of the groups shift, then we can say that there is a quantitative relationship between the consumption of the product or the attendance of the grouping and the relative outcome of the system. This is the basis of correlation for causal effect and the metric by which we assess whether things are worthwhile, or we say an intervention, doing something medically, doing something behaviorally has a causative outcome 
on that system. So we say that the, the P coefficient or the P value is significant if the deviation of the norm of the mean is greater than 0 0.05. That would be a statistically significant correlation. Okay? Well, we'll continue on with this on Wednesday. You guys have learned something fascinating and new that you now have a metric by which you can associate whether or not doing something different changes the outcome. Now you can scientifically make a statement about whether or not eating the side berries is healthy. Okay. Talk to you later on. I need to get a copy of whatever the statistics course work is now because